We're doing this series on Christian living, and today it's hearing God. And I was thinking as we were singing, um, we were singing that uh, song with the lines in it drawn from the Old Testament about uh, how at God's name the mountains shake and crumble. And I couldn't help thinking about my, one of my, the ending of one of my favorite New Testament chapters um, in Philippians 3, where we end up with, uh, uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. If that's what hearing God's name does to the world, what must God's voice be like, God's own voice? Because you very seldom say your own name unless you're introducing yourself. It's usually other people who say your name. So if just hearing God's name causes the mountains to shake and crumble, uh, if just hearing Jesus' name causes every knee to bow, and not just the knees on earth, but the ones above and below and everywhere, what must God's voice be like? And that kind of thought, I think, is what gives us some of our expectations about what it's like to hear God, if we can... And I think a lot of our expectations about what it must be like to hear God's voice are, are founded in that story in the Old Testament about Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, I'm not sure it's conscious, but I think unconsciously that's the case. Because there on Mount Sinai, Moses was face to face with God, hearing God's own voice. And there's that, that story about how Moses comes down from the mountain and his face is shining, and the light is so bright that people make him wear a veil to... To, to dim the light. Um, and somehow or other, we've got that in our heads, I think, as, as, as the picture of what God's voice is like. And so we kind of expect that that's what God's voice should be like, and we feel a bit guilty that uh, we never hear God's voice like that. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak and God would answer him in thunder. I don't know about you, but uh, honestly, I can't say that God has ever spoken to me with a voice of thunder. Um, when there's thunder and lightning, I'm usually thinking of other things. Um, um, but actually, if you, if you read on into that passage, we begin to see that this isn't being told to us to tell us what we can expect God's voice to sound like. Let's go to the next one. Um, when the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai, the to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look, otherwise many of them will perish. This voice of thunder is for Moses. It's not for everybody. Everybody else is to be kept away. Moses is to make sure they don't come close. The voice of thunder is just for Moses. And it's because what's going on is something really special. This is the time when God gives to his people um, the, 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 the conditions of the covenant, the agreement, the partnership he's making with them. And Moses is the person chosen to receive all that. This isn't a paradigm, a model that we can take for our hearing God. This is a one-off event. So, where else do we turn for our pictures of what it's like to hear God's voice? Maybe we turn not to Moses, uh, but to the other Old Testament character who was with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Elijah. Because if it's not Moses, it's Elijah, who's one of the key people in the Old Testament. Not the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel and the wonderful victory that we keep teaching to the children in Sunday school, but just after that. Barbara's laughing because we both taught it to them. And, uh, um, but just after that, because Elijah's had this great triumph. And you remember how it goes. They have these two altars and the prophets of Baal try to call down the fire and uh, nothing happens. And uh, Elijah taunts them and says, maybe he's asleep. Perhaps he's a bit deaf, shout a bit louder and all that. 
And then Elijah asked for water to be poured, poured over his, and bang, there's the fire. And no, not that story. After that. Because do you remember what happens after that? Yeah, Elijah runs away. He's frightened by Queen Jezebel and her threats. He runs away and he hides. He got up, ate and drank, because there he is on the mountain. And he went on in the strength of that for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. And in that place he came to a cave, and he spent the night there. So this is not Elijah on Mount Carmel. This is Elijah on Mount Horeb, um, the same mountain as Moses. Only Elijah is um, hiding in a cave. So the story's a bit different. And I think fits us a bit better, to be honest. Most of us, I think, will be hiding in a cave. <laughs> then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So it sounds as if it's getting a bit like the Moses story. Now, there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. It is a bit like the Moses story. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, and this translation has the sound of sheer silence. A still small voice was the authorized version. And there's so much variety of translation because we don't really know quite how to, how to render the, the, the Hebrew words. It's difficult. Um, but what's quite clear is that what came after the drama of the earthquake, the wind, and the fire was the opposite of the drama of earthquake, wind, and fire. Um, it was the nearest thing you can get to silence and still be a voice. Earthquake, wind, and fire are dramatic sounds. This was the opposite of a dramatic sound. It was the least dramatic sound you can imagine. And, and that's what we're meant to picture when we read this still small voice or the sheer sound of silence or however you translate it. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Because God wasn't in the earthquake, the wind, the fire. Where Elijah heard God was in this voice that was almost silence. The nearest thing to silence that you can imagine and still be a voice. That's where Elijah heard God. That's one of the problems with talking about hearing God. Because as you look through the Bible, it seems as if almost every time God speaks, the way in which God is heard is different. Let's go to something completely different. Because sometimes the still small voice is not enough. And for Jonah, um, well, Jonah had heard God. Go to Nineveh, says God. And Jonah then promptly heads off and finds a boat going to Tarshish. And at that point, um, Jonah, obviously, um, the still small voice isn't sufficient. And so God has to try a bit harder. And there's an enormous storm, and uh, finally Jonah arranges for the sailors to chuck him overboard so that they can be safe. You see, he's not all bad. Um, and then after he's been chucked overboard, God sends this enormous fish to swallow him whole. And that's how God gets his message across to Jonah. And I'm sure most of us have, at some points in our lives, been Jonah's when God has had to shout to make us hear. Sometimes God speaks to us in the almost silence like Elijah. Sometimes God has to shout. But it's more than that, because God speaks in so many ways. To Jeremiah, I rather like this bit, God spoke through a bad pun. Well, it wasn't a bad pun, it was actually quite a good pun. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me, Je uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 11, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see the branch of an almond. Then the Lord said to me, 
You've seen well, for I'm watching over my word to perform it. In English, it doesn't sound like a pun. It isn't a pun. But in Hebrew, uh, almond, the, an almond tree is shaked. And the verb to watch over is shakad, and the, the, the sort of noun from it, watching over, is shoked. So, shaked, an almond tree, shoked, uh, watching over. There's the pun. And that's how God spoke to Jeremiah. The very first time that's recorded in Scripture of God speaking to Jeremiah. Um, Jeremiah may have heard God before, but we're not told about it. The first one we're told about is when God makes a pun. And it's more varied than that. Turn to the New Testament. Peter. The, the, the early church is in turmoil because uh, various people have been preaching to the Gentiles. And up to that point, Christianity had been a Jewish, a branch of, 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 of Jewish religion. And lots of Gentiles have been converted. And lots of the early disciples had real problems with that, including Peter. And what happens? Well, you know the story in Acts chapter 10. While all this turmoil is building around him, um, Peter has gone visiting, and he's very hungry, and he starts to daydream while he's waiting for the food to come. Well, it's not quite how the Bible puts it. Um, this tran the translation I've been reading says he fell into a trance um, and had a vision. Um, but we've just been told how hungry he is and how he's been waiting. And so my mind makes the connection that this is Peter daydreaming. And God uses Peter's daydream um, to tell him that whatever God has made clean is not unclean. And that if Gentiles are being converted, it doesn't matter that they're Gentiles. Um, and he uses the picture of this um, big blanket full of uh, food coming down, and all the food is stuff that the law had proclaimed unclean. Well, back to the Old Testament, Jacob. Jacob has a proper dream, you know, when you're asleep and are really dreaming, not daydreaming. God uses daydreams and dreams. God uses puns. God uses the earthquake, wind, and fire. And God uses the silence that isn't earthquake, wind, and fire. In Acts 15, God uses a business meeting. Uh, it's when this issue of the, incorporating the Gentiles into the church comes to a head. And Paul and some of the others have been called to Jerusalem for a special business meeting with all the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. And there's been what my Bible calls no small dissension and debate. I like that phrase, no small dissension and debate. You know what that means, don't you? They'd practically been at fisticuffs. Not quite, but nearly. There'd been a big argument going on as both sides had put their case and they put it firmly. And the ones who were against incorporating the Gentiles had pointed out how God required all this stuff in the law of the Old Testament, and if God had required it, who were we to, to set it aside? And uh, Paul and his party have been pointing out how God was converting Gentiles and putting the Holy Spirit on them, and if God was giving them the Holy Spirit, who were we to stop him? And they, they'd argued it away. No small dissension and debate. And then they come to a decision, and James says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We Baptists are not wrong. God can speak through the dissension and debate of a church meeting. <laughs> or, I suspect, through other dissension and debate. You see, the picture we're getting as we start to look at examples from the Bible of how God speaks is that the one thing we can't do is pin it down. God speaks in all kinds of different ways and different places. And when we want a neat pattern to it, God breaks that open. Think back in the Old Testament about how God spoke to the foreigner, the foreign general, Naaman. Who did God use to speak to the foreign general, Naaman? We're back in Sunday school stories. One or two nods. Tell me, who? Yeah, a little girl. God uses a child to, to speak. Whatever, whatever little box you want to put God speaking into, it... God speaking does not fit that little box. The one thing we can be sure about is the ways in which God speaks are going to be different and surprising. 
Doesn't actually make it any easy for us, does it, though? The practical problem of knowing when it's God speaking and when the voice we're hearing is something different. So how do we know it's God? Because, you see, there, were, there have always been people who get it wrong. People who proclaim firmly and solidly, God said to me, and who are firmly wrong. The classic example of that is in the book of Jeremiah again, where there are two prophets, Jeremiah and Hananiah, and their messages are absolutely opposite, and both of them are saying, God said. This is the word of the Lord, they both say. And there's no indication in the Bible that um, Hananiah is telling lies. Um, that Hananiah doesn't believe that he's heard God's voice. The way he acts, um, he's so confident and sure, it seems to me that it, rather he does believe he's heard God's voice. But he's got it wrong. And if you think back over your story, you can probably think of times when people have declared to you firmly and solidly, this is the word of the Lord, and it wasn't. And yet, it ought to be as simple as one, two, three. First question, does what the person is saying or what the voice is saying fit with Scripture? If what you're hearing is not what Scripture says, then you can be pretty sure that it's not God. That the voice you're hearing is your own, your own wishes or somebody else's wishes, but not God's. Because God doesn't contradict himself. Does it fit with Scripture? And then, does the Holy Spirit confirm it? When we're converted, when we are become Christian, God puts his Holy Spirit in us. And the way Paul talks about it is that there are times when God's Spirit and our Spirit are together. Uh, there are times when God's Spirit is praying within us. So, if the voice we've heard is God then the Holy Spirit within us ought to resonate with that. And that res we should feel that and know. And thirdly, because we might be mistaken, like poor Hananiah, what we need to do is to ask other people. Because if the voice we're hearing is God's voice, then other Christians around us should be hearing it too, or at very least, when we tell them about it, should be saying, yes, that fits. And it really is as simple as one, two, three. Ask the first question. Does what I'm hearing fit with Scripture? If the answer is no, you needn't go any further. You needn't go on to number two. Because clearly it's not God's voice. If that one's a bit difficult, or you need some more confirmation, go to number two. Is this message resonating with the Holy Spirit within me? Does, does does it fit with, 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 with what God is doing, saying, inside me? And then if it, you're still saying yes, do the third check. Ask other people. Now notice the order, because the order's important. You don't do the third check first. If you do the third check first, you will probably get it wrong. Because very often other people will be telling you exactly the wrong thing. But, the, so the order is important. First of all, we rule out the stuff that isn't, doesn't fit with Scripture. Then, we ask God inside us. And then, we're, if we're still convinced, we go to the other people for confirmation. But before all that, if the voice of God is at least sometimes the still small voice that's the opposite of the earthquake, the wind, and the fire. How would you set about hearing when someone's whispering? What would you do? You need to be quiet, yes. Because if you're not quiet, you won't hear the whisper. But probably, if, if you can't hear somebody, what I tend to do is to sort of lean over closer to them. Is that not what you do when you can't hear? 
if we want to hear God's voice, then we need to be close to God. And there is no better model of that than Jesus. And we know that Jesus was familiar with the scriptures. He knew his Bible. We know it because every time there is someone who challenges him, asks him a really difficult question, consistently, I said every time, it might not be every time, I'm not a, a, a gospel scholar, and I'm, I, I might have missed a few, but nearly every time at least, that someone challenges Jesus with a difficult question, the way Jesus replies comes from Scripture. And, time and again, Jesus goes off to a quiet place, most often on his own, sometimes with a few others, and prays. You see, Jesus kept himself set up and ready to hear the still small voice because he was close to God. The problem with most of us is that we are too busy to get close to God. Uh, there's so much going on that gets in the way. And then we expect God to yell at us. We shouldn't. Sometimes God will yell at us. Sometimes God will treat us like Jonah. But that's not what God wants. God didn't want to have to send a storm for Jonah. God wanted Jonah to get up and go when God said, get up and go. At least he wanted him to get up and go to Nineveh when he said, get up and go to Nineveh. And not to get up and go to Tarshish when he said, get up and go to Nineveh. God will sometimes shout at us if he has to. But how much better if we put ourselves into the right place to hear the still, small voice, the opposite of the earthquake, the wind, and the fire. Instead of expecting God to treat us special, like he treated Moses, and to speak to us in the thunder at the top of the mountain, how much better if we've made ourselves ready to hear the opposite of earthquake, wind, and fire. And the way to do that is to copy Jesus to draw close to God. And two of the key ways we do that are by reading our Bibles regularly and often and by talking to God. If you don't talk to someone, you can't expect to hear much that they say. It really is as simple as that. And when we think we've heard, we test it. Does it fit with what we know about God through the Bible? through the story of Jesus? Does it cause echoes from the Holy Spirit inside me? And then thirdly and lastly, do other people agree? Let's pray. Lord, there are so many times when we would dearly like to hear your voice, when we're puzzled and confused and don't know what to do especially. Lord, we keep wanting you to yell at us. Make it absolutely blindingly clear. Teach us rather to become ready to hear your whisper. Draw us closer to you through our Bible reading, through our praying, through coming to church, through all of the many ways in which you do it, through the mountains and the hills and the grass and the trees. Draw us closer to you so that day by day we may hear your whispers. And when we hear your whisper, Lord, remind us to check so that we don't become like Hananiah proclaiming your word when you haven't spoken. We ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.
simple, isn't it? <laughs> it's like anything. It's like I learned to row, and um, it, it, that you look at the Olympians doing it, don't you, on the TV, and it looks simple. <laughs> Once you get into a boat, it's not quite so simple, but it's a thing as practice and time goes by. It gets easier, doesn't it? And just to think of what Tim's been saying with this last song. is like, God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision. It is. That's what we do. It's just come, spend time. Listen, talk, spend time. Let's dance. Should we sing this? I have a benediction from Shane. <laughs>